Looks like it's noon, so we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Department of Grand Rounds, everyone. My name is Celia Hayring. I'm one of the inpatient chief medical residents here at UW Montlake, and I am excited to be facilitating today's session. Um, as a reminder, throughout today's talk, please submit any questions that you might have through the chat function. I'll be monitoring the chat, um, grouping those questions to pose to our speaker at the end of the talk. So today we're going to be hearing from Dr. Susan Graham about HIV treatment and prevention, long-acting modalities, patient preferences, and implementation challenges. Dr. Susan Graham is a professor of global health and medicine, an adjunct professor of epidemiology, and director of the University of Washington's Behavioral Research Center for HIV. Her research focuses on HIV prevention and care interventions in the United States and in Kenya. She sees patients on the Infectious Diseases Consult Service at Harborview Medical Center and provides HIV and PrEP care at a bi-monthly Madison Clinic satellite in Olympia. Dr. Graham received her MD from McGill University in Montreal and her PhD in Clinical Epidemiology from the University of Toronto. And with that, I'll take uh, turn things over to Dr. Graham to take it away. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, really appreciate that, Celia. Um, it's, it's nice to have this opportunity to present um, on um, sort of this topic in general, as well as some of my research specifically. Um, I'll start with some uh, disclosures. If I can get my screen to advance. Let's see, it just worked, but no, it doesn't want to. Right again, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, I, the work that I'm presenting today was funded by a grant from the National Institute of Mental Health, um, and um, I'm going to be discussing some pharma pharmaceutical agents that are in the pipeline and not yet FDA approved, um, but have no other conflicts. Um, I'm going to just go through um, sort of a brief overview. We're first going to start with why are we looking at or why do we need long-acting modalities for HIV treatment um, and prevention? Um, we're going to talk about the new medications that have become available um, and a little bit on those in development in terms of longer-acting non-oral um, or, or long-acting oral um, uh, modalities. Uh, I'm going to spend uh, a certain amount of time on what patients uh, think about uh, long-acting therapies um, for treatment, and that is sort of the focus of the research um, supported by my R01. We'll talk then uh, about some of the implementation challenges that have been um, happening uh, here in the States as we move forward with some of these agents, and then just a little bit about um, my thinking about the future of long-acting treatment and prevention um, in the United States as well as overseas. Um, so first, really starting with why would we need these need long-acting modalities for HIV prevention and treatment? Um, you know, at this point in HIV um, treatment, single tablet regimens have become the gold standards. Um, and this is versus the bad old days when people used to be taking handfuls of pills, with, you know, a lot of drug in interactions and, and really was challenging to be on HIV treatment. But with the, um, the single um, pill regimens that really became available first in 2006, but with the, the latest edition in 2016 of Victarvi, which has many advantages, including fewer drug interactions and a very high barrier to resistance. Um, many, many patients are able to re really uh, maintain um, virologic control and um, be undetectable and um, are really, really doing well. However, um, we still have gaps in who these regimens are working for. I've got the King County data in the bottom left. We do better than some uh, places in the country for a number of reasons we may touch on later. But uh, here in King County, 84% of people who have been diagnosed with HIV are virologically suppressed. And um, that's really only 78% of all people living with HIV because of gaps in the uh, care cascade, including diagnosis, um, linkage to care, et cetera. Um, in terms of the entire country, only 57% of people living with HIV are virologically suppressed. And we it's hard to, um, to state exactly how, uh, it's hard to really um, 
uh, quantify how the current treatment and the uh, undesirability of taking a pill every day factors into this. Um, but we do know that a number of patients and people living with HIV experience barriers to care and treatment that are really related uh, often to social determinants of health. Um, there are problems like homelessness, substance use, mental health uh, or mental illness, uh, poverty, stigma, just plain forgetting or, or fatigue with pills and then medication side effects that really can be barriers to people achieving the adherence that's needed in order to be virally suppressed. Um, so there have been these advances in long acting therapies, not just for HIV, there are advances that may lead to uh, the possibility to do this in a number of areas. Um, uh, these relate to new nanoparticle technologies um, that um, take sort of poorly water-soluble um, uh, pharmaceutic agents and uh, can uh, use those to create formulations that are either solid drug particles or microparticles or microspheres that are in suspensions, oil-based solutions of uh, medications that are more lipophilic, um, in situ implants and solution-based immunotherapies such as broadly nutri neutralizing antibodies, which we'll talk about briefly. Um, the challenges for HIV treatment, especially in terms of, of making long-acting regimens that can be used for treatment, um, are, 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 you know, are real barriers uh, to moving forward for HIV treatment, although we have some options. So um, for HIV, prevention is easier and generally requires only one drug for pre-exposure uh, pre prophylaxis. When you have, uh, when you actually have HIV, um, infection, the treatment requires at least three drugs to attain virologic suppression initially, and at least two to maintain it. It's lifelong treatment, so you certainly want something that people can tolerate. And one of the challenges with um, sort of discontinuing or switching regimens is that if levels of a, of a drug becomes ther subtherapeutic and there's not adequate um, suppression with another drug, um, resistance can easily emerge. In terms of modes of administration, these new long-acting depot medications can be delivered in a number of ways, either subcutaneously or intramuscularly or as in implants, um, not shown in this, in this um, image. Um, the oil-based solutions can often be um, more subcutaneous and then these suspensions, microparticles and in, uh, inside to forming gels or semi-solid structures are usually given um, intramuscularly. Um, there are limitations um, in terms of what people will tolerate. Um, and it's generally um, felt that for adults, um, you know, five milliliters may be the, the maximum that someone can tolerate. Um, some people, not even that. And just down to two cc's for children. So it's so you, you do need to have a very potent um, agent that can um, that that can be delivered in a volume that can be tolerated. And then of course implants, as we know from family planning, require insertion procedures and a number of uh, you, you know in a way to to remove the device. So um, there are some challenges to um, to working in this area. Um, but you know the attraction for long acting. Um, uh, antiretroviral therapy is, you know, for a lot of people, the longer, the longer half-life gives the infrequent dosing that many people would like. There are potent nanoformulations now and these lower do doses are required. So we can be able to get, get some that are able to be uh, injected at the volumes that people tolerate. Um, for some of the uh, more lipophilic um, sort of agents, there is the thought that some of them will be taken up um, by macrophages and, and selectively directed to lymph nodes in, 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 uh, just naturally, and that that might help with HIV. Um, there's not, it's not yet clear whether there's real clinical benefit or an agent that does this quite yet. Um, but, you know, the primary thing for patients is addressing pill health fatigue. They won't have to take the tablets anymore. Um, for providers, there's the possibility of directly observing the treatment and knowing that your patient actually has levels of antiretrovirals for a given time. 
there's protection of health privacy when um, individuals who are living with roommates or living with family um, and may not want um, folks to know their status um, has that protection. And really it can decrease HIV related stigma as well. Um, and in qualitative work so far, it really is something that people living with HIV have really commented on with some of the new injectable regimens. Um, for instance, here's a trial participant, a man from Spain who said at the beginning, I thought, I hope I get over this depression. My God, I hope I won't be taking these pills all my life. And then I went on the injectable phase and it was like I saw the light that how easy and convenient this is. And for a woman in the United States, I love it because I don't have to take a daily medication. So that's just one less thing on my plate that I have to worry about. I definitely feel there's less pressure. I like the injection because it's not a daily in my face, I have to do this thing. Um, so what new medications do we have? What, what's already available? And, and then I'll touch a little bit on what's in the immediate pipeline. Um, and um, then we'll go on to talk about what, what patients think about this. In terms of uh, post-exposure prophylaxis and pre-exposure prophylaxis, there are many options. And um, you know, starting from uh, back in the time where really non, uh, the non-occupational PrEP or uh, post-exposure uh, uh, prophylaxis or PEP was first um, recommended in 2005, then eventually pre-exposure prophylaxis with Truvada in 2012. In 2019, Descovy was approved. Um, we also have an intermittent regimen for the uh, oral prep. And then finally, by 2020, we start to get non-oral um, options, including the Depivirine ring, which is approved by the WHO, but not by the US FDA. Um, and then finally, um, just in 2021, cabotegavir for PrEP. Um, and so there have been some nice, there's starting to be nice options in the toolkit for, um, for HIV prevention. Um, the IM cabotegavir for PrEP, um, which was approved in 2021, um, was shown to be effective in two major uh, clinical trials of the HIV, HIV prevention trials network. Um, in 083, the population was men who have sex with men and transgender women. And in 084, it was cisgender women. Um, in the men um, and transgender women, um, the uh, there was about a 60, there was about a two-thirds reduction in um, HIV incidence. Um, there was even larger, almost 90% reduction in the women. Um, there was a there, and, and the difference really has to do with um, adherence because a, adherence to HIV oral prep was um, was lower in the um, in the arm that had uh, basically uh, Truvada prep. Um, so there does seem to be really a good an advantage in terms of overcoming barriers to adherence um, with the injection. Uh, the trade-off is a little bit injection site reactions, which were very common in the MSM and transgender women, um, and a little less common, interestingly, in the women. Um, it's a three uh, cc injection that's given every two months after that same loading loading dose at baseline and um, and at four weeks um, to kind of get levels up quickly. Um, so, but this this is definitely something that we're going to start seeing more and more of um, as as it gets rolled out in the U.S. And then in 2021, same year, uh, and the FDA also approved um, an IM treatment reg regimen, and this is the first and so far only um, uh, injectable um, HIV treatment regimen we have. It's uh, Cabinuva, which is a combination of cabotegravir and milpivirine, uh, integrates strand inhibitor and a NNRTI. They were shown to be, um, this, this injectable regimen was shown to be effective compared to um, oral, daily oral tablets. In the FLARE trial, for which the comparator was Triumet, and that enrolled people who were treatment naive prior to screening. Um, and had uh, um, excellent, basically comparable results in both arms. And then the ATLAS trial, which had people with HIV on, um, who had already been on treatment for six months um, before switching to the injectable regimen or continuing with their baseline regimen. 
Um, and again, pretty comparable, 92.5 versus 95.5 in terms of the outcomes. Um, this uh, regimen is given as a 3cc injection, um, which can be every two months, um, or you use that 3cc load uh, with the higher dose of the two meds, followed by a 2cc load every month, um, which could potentially be attractive to people who can't tolerate the larger injection as well. Um, and there are a number of trials and studies coming out now that that show that this regimen is um, is effective for people. This is uh, one called Solar that uh, looked at the non inferiority of um, of the Cabanuva um, injectable regimen compared to Victarvi, which is what the latest of the um, uh, and the best tolerated of the daily oral tablets. Again, really comparable. And sort of as a lead into the to the role of patient preference, um, there was extremely high treatment satisfaction in that trial. And of people who experienced the injectable regimen, 90% preferred um, that, but 5% actually preferred their Victarvi and went back to that at the end of the trial. So um, there are definitely um, differences in, you know, people have different preferences in terms of, of um, where they'll want to go with this type of treatment. So um, there are some additional regimens in development. We'll talk about a few more at, towards the end as well. There are HIV treatment trials, um, one with a weekly oral regimen that involves um, islatravir and lenacapavir. Um, We'll talk about lenacapavir a bit more at the end, but basically a weekly oral regimen that might be tolerable. So that's of interest. Uh, there is also a, a, a very small trial or study of um, an infusion of broadly neutralizing antibodies and, um, and every six month lenacapavir, uh, a capsid inhibitor um, that it looks like it's going to be tolerated, um, but it really is limited to patients sensitive to those broadly neut neutralizing antibodies. Um, in terms of long-acting PrEP, the lenacapavir that's um, included in those other uh, of those pending treatment trials does look like it's going to be a viable PrEP regimen. That trial is ongoing, and it's at every six-month sub-Q injection, which is fantastic. There are trials of, of islatravir as an implant that's, um, that was paused because of side effects, but is now ongoing again at a lower dose. Um, and then Victarvir, sorry, as a slow release IM injection is some, also in development, as well as there are some rectal and vaginal inserts for PrEP that are in development with l and TAP which might um, provide a two, uh, sort of, sorry, a two drug more like a, a treatment regimen. So others to be, uh, to be determined, um, but what do patients think about these therapies? And you know, we've got these different things that are coming up in the toolbox, but what is, what is really um, going to be the, the opinion of patients and what are they going to want? Um, and why is this important? Um, well, we know that, that Participants in clinical trials are not representative of all the patients that we treat. Um, patients may have some strong preferences regarding injection pain, site reactions, other side effects, um, needles. Um, most regimens um, or the individual drugs in them have drawbacks that can reduce the acceptability um, of the regimen, limiting uptake and continuation, um, depending on the on preferences. And so we need to really understand the product attributes and the individual patient characteristics that relate to those preferences that will sort of drive end user acceptability. Um, and so especially at this time when there are a lot of things maybe in development that may prove to be feasible, that may or may not um, be um, as effective as what's already out there, um, studies of patient preferences help drug developers to um, sort of focus on the, the products that, that seem most desirable to um, patients. And also it helps funders to identify and prioritize those products um, and the delivery modes that are most likely to impact uptake and sustain use and help us um, sort of uh, meet that gap in HIV treatment. So um, that is the focus of uh, the R01 uh, that I have. 
um, that I have co-led with Jane Simone um, from psychology, who has recently left for the NIH. So I'm now leading this. Um, working with co-investigators Doug uh, Bartold and Brett Hauber from the um, Choice Institute in the Department of Pharmacology. It's a, uh, their health, econo uh, health economists. Um, also working with a co-investigator, co Vince Marconi at Emory, he's an HIV um, ID specialist as I am. And then um, uh, John Knuthia, who's an obstetrician who's done a lot of HIV research in Kenya. So this is the only grant I've ever had that involves work both in the US and in Kenya, which is, has been kind of fun. Um, it's a five-year study of patient preferences um, for long-acting antiretroviral treatment. Um, and what we um, are doing, what we have done is to design and pilot test something called a discrete choice experiment um, to really identify the product and delivery attributes that are related to acceptability for U.S. patients. And we have conducted um, and completed um, that DCE, recruiting 700 patients in Seattle and Atlanta, 200 of them more on the ART naive or early, early ART side, and then 500 very experienced patients um, to see if, if uh, duration of treatment matters. Um, and we are, now that we've finished the US work, we are um, uh, in the middle, we've pilot tested and designed a similar DCE in Kenya, and we're now um, conducting the discrete choice experiment there. Um, recruiting from several um, HIV clinics in Nairobi. Um, and uh, so for those of you who've never heard of a discrete choice experiment or a DCE, as I'll refer to it, um, this is a, it's a method used to, to assess stated preferences. So, which is, is, is not actual preferences because you don't yet have all of the things for them to choose from um, perfectly delineated. So you're saying hypothetical choices um, of potential end users for a product or service. It's really increasingly common in health services research, research uh, not just in HIV, but for a number of different conditions. It's a quantitative methodology. So it, it basically, it's based on the fact that we all make trade-offs. And if you show me, say, a uh, a blue sports car versus a red pickup truck. And what I really want is a blue uh, blue pickup truck. You know, which am I gonna choose? Am I gonna go with the color or is it the type of car? You know, what is what is really driving, what, you know, what turns out to be the thing that I that influences my choice the most? Um, and so you're choosing an alternative of a product or a service and you're trying to maximize the, the utility or the benefit to yourself. Um, and so in this method, potential end users are presented with different scenarios for products um, that have different attributes. Um, you know, it could be the color of the truck or uh, it could be for a drug. It could be, well, this is an oral pill. This is an injectable thing. This is a ring. Um, they're asked to select the one with their, um, their preferred option. And um, then and, and they can be asked about willingness to pay for that option. So you can really sort of see what, what people would go for. Um, they allow us to predict what product profile would be most acceptable to a target population in general, as well as to look for different patterns of preferences in the within that population and determine which patient characteristics are associated with the different preference patterns people have. Um, we had done, and usually you start out with qualitative work to sort of define the attributes and understand what is going to be important um, to, um, to that, the target population. And um, Dr. Simone and I had done already focus group discussions with patients in both the U.S. and Kenya to explore the acceptability of injectable treatment. Um, and in that work, uh, one of the things that was mentioned the most, of course, is efficacy. It has to be at least as, as effective as pill-based regimens. Uh, people were concerned about side effects, maybe injection pain or reactions, and the frequency, and where do I get this thing? Um, and um, often in those qualitative groups, um, fear of needles or just like of injections did come up. So um, making, you know, making it clear that there are some people who will not um, be interested due to various concerns about where the injection would take place, how big the needle was, how many injections they would have in the injection volume. So people, especially who have experienced injections, um, 
uh, you know, realize that there, there are some things that scare them. Um, so we had that information from patients, but we, as we started our R01 work, we needed information on really the products that were most likely to become available. And this work was done about three years, years ago. So based on the best information at the time, we found, uh, we interviewed several key informants um, in the United States. We did 12, 12 interviews, um, plus a few local ones we didn't really count as participants, um, to um, understand what was likely to be available and what people thought the attributes of those um, uh, products might be. And so we we talked to, um, locally, we talked to uh, Dr. Rodney Ho, who's in the Department of Pharmaceutics um, in developing subcutaneous um, ART and through the UW TLC ART project, uh, as well as LEAP, which is an NIH funded sort of consortium looking at long acting products, the HIV uh, Prevention Trials Network, the AIDS Clinical Trial Group, and Vive and Merck, so some of the folks who are players in this area. And we came up with the attributes um, that we finally selected for um, our study. And um, this, this image sort of uh, is, is sort of where we started before our interviews and then where we ended up. Um, we wanted to include um, different types. We thought about infusions of uh, neutralizing antibodies, but people thought those would not be ready for treatment in this time. So we focused on IM and sub-Q injections, implants, and long-acting oral pills. Um, we uh, thought about different frequencies, and I'll go into that more on the next slide. We thought location of administration could be home, pharmacy, or clinic, and given that some vaccinations are done in pharmacies and uh, pharmacists are now licensed to do um, injections. We removed effectiveness as an attribute because we decided that, you know, if, if it would not be approved unless it was effective. And because that do dominated so much in the uh, focus group discussions, we didn't want that to drown out the other choices people were making. So we just said baseline, everything will be effective. Um, we used pain and pain was selected and then um, uh, a lot of these regimens require some sort of lead in to bring up levels and or to test um, to make sure that people are undetectable or to test for uh, allergies and other things. They suggested we divide those into two different things. So the time that a patient has to be undetectable on oral therapy before they can switch to the reg uh, to the regimen and also that uh, the need for allergy testing. Yes or no. So um, uh, we we. We broke those into different things. And then we looked at sort of the forgiveness of regimen, which we ended up calling late dose leeway after all sorts of discussion about the best way to, to call that. Um, and that's basically how late you can be for your dose and still be undetectable. Um, we initially thought about frequency of clinic follow-ups, but no, everyone thought that the doctors are going to want to see their patients at about the same timing and that we shouldn't have that be part of it. Uh, so it's really about the receipt of the medication itself. Um, and yes, and we decided that leeway was a function of sort of how long that particular um, type of a product was going to ask. And just to go into that a little bit more, we realized that um, for some of these different modes um, that there need to be restrictions on the types of levels that some of these things could have, for instance, a long-acting oral tablet um, would probably be something between weekly or monthly, um, whereas an implant, you certainly would not want a weekly implant. So we thought, well, maybe every six months for an implant might be feasible, but really if, you know, every every year might be more, more feasible. Um, and then, of course, location was only um, for certain products. You're not going to get an implant at home, for instance. So that was only done in the clinic. Um, long acting oral would only be done at home, um, although directly observed therapy would be possible. And then each of these um, modes have sort of restrictions, you know, have pain that comes with them or does not. So we, we, we had these restrictions in our experiment that as we set it up. Um, and it's, and we basically adopted some assumptions that we explained to participants. So we said to assume that all options would work equally well, they would get you undetectable, um, but none of them are cures because we don't have that yet. 
Um, we also ask them to take cost out of it. Uh, we have no way of predicting costs and co-pays and that sort of thing. And it was, and since we were uh, working in both uh, Washington State and Georgia, um, where insurance is quite different, we took cost out of it. And also we were doing this in, during COVID, um, such a fun time to do research. And so we uh, had a lot of people um, participate virtually um, uh, and um, they uh, we, we we told them to assume that COVID was not part of their um, of their HIV treatment at that point. Uh, so the instrument that we used to like to, to do this experiment was a you know a, a fairly lengthy uh, sort of uh, questionnaire uh, that uh, would was delivered. It was web based. They could do it in clinic or they could actually do it from home, which we needed during COVID. And um, they, there were sections that explained the purpose of the study, went through the different types of things like described uh, uh, intramuscular injections, described subcutaneous injections, um, described implants, um, and then asked comprehension questions to ensure that people understood um, what we were, um, what we were, what, what they were looking at and choosing between. We also had asked a number of questions on the respondents' history with HIV and HIV treatment, uh, on how many regimens they'd had, how many pills were in their current regimen, and then questions about other personal characteristics, um, such as age, um, race, sex, um, that might um, uh, affect their preferences. And then they got the DCE choice sets. And to show you what this looks like, this is, this is a screenshot of one of our um, choice sets. Um, and participants were presented with a number of these. I, I believe it was 17 altogether in the end. Um, and basically each of these choice sets have a treatment type. So the left column is really the different attributes we focused on. So where do you get it? How often do you get it? Is, um, you know, uh, all of the different attributes and you are given option A, um, an option B, um, so in, there was a little image of the injections under the skin or the long acting pills or the um, implant. Um, and then they were always given a, an opt out um, option, which was to just stick with their current regimen. So basically, you know, no, I don't want, I don't want either of these. I just want to continue taking my daily oral pill. And finally they were asked which they preferred and they would click on that. So they would cycle through a number of these different choice sets and, and there would, you know, all of these different things varied. Um, it, basically the way you do this, they, the participants were randomly assigned when they enrolled to one of four blocks of questions. Um, each of the blocks had 16 out of the 64 possible choice sets. The choice sets were shown in a random order um, and uh, we used a, a software for DCE creation in order to do this called NGene. We added actually a 17th choice because we wanted to learn a little bit more about the long acting pills and have some, um, so we added one that was just comparing two long acting pill regimens. Um, so finally, when we did um, in, uh, recruit our, our um, full population, we have 700 people with HIV, 350 in Washington State, 350 in Atlanta. Um, and Washington State uh, participants were recruited from Madison Clinic as well as all its satellites. Uh, you may have heard I work in, in a satellite in Olympia. There are several um, sort of satellites. Uh, uh, I think are, there are currently six, including Federal Way and a number of them. Um, in Atlanta, it was mostly Emory, the um, infectious disease clinic or um, infectious disease program, I believe it's called. Uh, you had to be 18 or older um, and enrolled at one of those clinics to participate. And we conducted this from March 2021 through June 2022. Um, we asked participants it, uh, for permission to link to their chart data to get viral load CD4 and various diagnoses, um, such as um, substance use or mental health diagnoses. And the mass, you know, the majority did, did consent to that, 86%. Um, and 81% answered every single question in the survey. Sometimes you get um, folks who will say, prefer not to say on certain things. So we had a fairly good um, participation rate, especially during COVID. Um, and this is just some select population characteristics, just comparing Atlanta and Seattle. They're very different places. And we were quite glad to have the mix of uh, participants we did have. 
Um, in Atlanta, 84% of participants were Black versus only 10% here in Seattle. Um, we had more Hispanic Latino uh, participants in Seattle at 12.6 versus 4.9 in Atlanta. Um, the modes of transmission are somewhat different um, in Atlanta. There are more heterosexual patients. And so we had up to almost 39% um, cisgender female participants in Atlanta versus only 9% here in Seattle. So very different uh, group. Um, of interest also is that um, health insurance coverage was much, much higher in Seattle than in Atlanta, where um, a third of participants had no um, insurance. They, they have not expanded Medicaid in Georgia. Um, slightly more people in, in Atlanta were on the single tablet regimens, and I think that's a, a likely a function of our Medicaid, which prefers to have people take um, uh, Descovy or Travada with um, a separate uh, uh, Tibicay or Dolutegravir uh, tablet. So um, that's uh, it's cheaper for Washington state to have two pills. But uh, the, and in Seattle, we had, um, you know, more 79% were undetectable versus only 64% in Atlanta. So, uh, you know, a, a nice um, mix of, of participants. Now, this is what the results of, the, of a DCE look like. And um, the, the results you get, the numbers are called preference weights um, and they're obtained by conditional uh, logis logistic regression because um, every, every choice is actually an outcome. So every choice made is an outcome and it's all conditional on what people were presented with. So it's very complicated to analyze these and Doug Barthold is fantastic and was, was the primary person doing this with me. Um, and just to give you an idea of what this means. So, to, um, on the bottom of the scale is a sort of a zero normalized um, sort of uh, rating. And then as things go to the right, they're, they're more positive. So people, pe things people liked are uh, off to the right, um, heading that way. And then the lines that go to the left are things that people uh, were not excited about. So they have a negative, more negative in terms of the preference. So that all of these are normalized around zero. Um, yeah, the positives uh, weights with the higher preference and um, and then the overall importance is sort of how long the lines are. So you can see right away that um, up at the top, probably, the, you know, the, the biggest span was for the different types of modes. Uh, current therapy is up there at the very top. It was slightly positive in, um, in the study. Long acting orals were the things that people were most excited about. And um, there you can see that implants a little less so, um, and then the injectables were, were slightly more positive than implants. There are 95% confidence bars around these. So there was variation in what people, um, you know, in, in the um, variability in the responses. In terms of frequency, not surprisingly, every three months was best, followed by every two, then then uh, monthly, and then weekly was considered to be um, the least desirable frequency. Um, and then uh, location, in, you know, most people wanted to be at home. Pharmacies were the least preferred, which was interesting. Um, people preferred not to have to be undetectable on oral therapy first. They preferred not to need allergy testing, and they wanted a lot of wiggle room to be late for their doses. But it, as you can see, the three attributes in the bottom, the yellow and purple and blue, had, had a smaller influence overall. And the things that really drove preferences were the type of mode as well as the frequency with which it was delivered. Um, predictors that we've looked at in, in the study um, that we were using to try and figure out which patients liked what types of thing include um, the ones here. So social demographic characteristic, various HIV re uh, related characteristics, including past adherence and things like that. And then other mental health related, as I mentioned, we did get mental health disorder diagnoses from the chart. We got, we abstracted substance use disorder diagnoses, injection drug use, um, uh, pill, the number of pills people are on just overall um, and, um, and anything on, we asked a question on how, how much they disliked injections. Um, 
So um, what was interesting too is that we had a number, uh, about 11% of our participants um, actually chose their current oral, oral therapy in every single task. They never got tempted to, to pick anything else, which was interesting. So we called that unwillingness to switch. And that was associated with um, low educational attainment um, or being unwilling to disclose, you know, prefer not to say for their education. Self-reported good adherence, so they think they're doing just fine. Aversion to injections, and um, actually Atlanta. There were more people in Atlanta who were not willing to switch. Um, so we've published that. And um, one of the, the last thing we're doing with our U.S. study is to look at latent classes of preferences, which is a way of sort of looking at preference profiles. Um, so it's a, there's variability. It's a heterogeneous sample. There are some people who have different um, different preferences. So you analyze this using latent class analysis. Um, and um, our sample had three classes. Um, the there was one class that really had a relatively high preference for implants. They were they were very interested in that idea. Get the implant. Don't think about it again for another you know uh, six to twelve months. There was a, a class that really preferred the long-acting uh, long oral pills or injections, um, but were not at all hot on implants. And both of those first two classes really preferred something else other than what they were on. And then the class three was the one that preferred their current treatment. And um, what was interesting is that, so the, the, the ones who were willing to switch, they were younger, more educated, less adherent to their current ART, so that's a group we want, um, and they were less averse to inje injections in general, um, which was, you know, uh, so that, that group, having them get injections was, it, it would be interesting. Um, yeah, class one was less likely to be virally suppressed in addition to reporting lower adherence, um, and they had easier clinic access, so they were group, they were folks who said, yeah, maybe this would help me. Uh, and what was interesting about the class two um, participants, not all of them had this, but there was a higher prevalence of psychotic disorders in the class that preferred long acting oral tablets or injections um, by far over implants. So we think, you know, the, psych the folks with psychotic disorders were not thrilled with the idea of an implant. Um, so it those are our results, and they're interesting in that they're able, we're able to sort of say something about what might be acceptable to people, what might not be, and which type of patients might prefer injections. Um, there are a lot of limitations to a discrete choice experiment. You do it, and that's it. Um, it ours only included patients who are engaged in care. So uh, of course we you know we can't say much about people who aren't linked to, to care retained in a clinic or even uh, diagnosed. Um, we did only have the two cities. Uh, we tried a first application with four cities and uh, they thought that was too much. Um, we weren't really able to split out subcutaneous and uh, intramuscular injections due to the, the models wouldn't converge and it was just complicated because of the restrictions we used. Um, and we, we didn't, we made a conscious decision not to like do com combined regimens, like maybe a monthly oral pill with a monthly injection or something like that, just because we thought that would be too hard for, um, patients to really make those choices. Um, and we can't distinguish preference from home from the preference for self-administration so that, um, often you know, uh, the things that the patients had control over um, were the things that they could do at home. Um, and we may have excluded potential products um, that may become on the market, market eventually um, or included things that turn out not to be feasible. I think the biggest mix, uh, mix we have is, is potentially lenacapavir if it, if it does become available as a treatment, uh, as part of a HIV treatment at every six months. Um, but it, it's still not clear there will be a full regimen that will work as that. So it's, so that's our caveat. Um, and of course, the limitation to all of this is these are hypothetical choices. So we're getting information on what people might like, but it may actually differ in practice in that they, they could try these things and decide they like them better or less than they originally thought they would. Um, and, you know, physicians might have play a role in helping people um, with these selections.
So we are currently doing the work in Kenya, and that's been really interesting. We, there, our interviews focus not on what products were available, but what, uh, what people thought would be feasible in Kenya. So we asked them about the most and least exciting products there and barriers and fil facilitators to roll out in Kenya. Um, we've analyzed those transcripts and have a submitted manuscript. Um, the results showed that, um, you know, a lot of the Kenyan, pretty much all of our key informants there thought that that uh, people with the HIV in Kenya would be, uh, would find long acting preferable because they don't like taking pills and have a lot of stigma about having pills in their home. Um, they found the IM injections and long acting oral pills to be the most exciting. Um, they were concerned about subcutaneous injections because uh, not many people have refrigeration, needle disposable would be hard there, um, and patient training for sub subcutaneous injections is, is complicated, so that's not a big thing in resource-limited settings. There were concerns about implants because of the training requirements for the healthcare workers, concerns that patients might worry about the impact on fertility because, of course, implants and injections like Depo, Provera are used in family planning. So there was a concern that 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 some um, individuals would, would shy away from these things. Uh, we Currently, pharmacies aren't used for HIV treatment in Kenya, but um, the Kenyan government is trying to fig figure out how to offload some clinics with, um, with uh, pharmacy work. And so they said, Please just keep that in. Let's see what they say. Um, and, and there was a very interesting, we did ask um, our key informants, who should get these? If you only had a limited supply, you know, say donors, you know, gave a certain amount of, of long acting treatments, who would you target? And some people actually said they would go with the adherent people because they've earned it. Um, which is sort of not going to help with that gap that we want to address. Um, but those who did say they would go for non-adherent people, um, thought adolescents in particular would be one group and as well as uh, uh, sex workers and other groups with a lot of stigma. Um, our preliminary results in Kenya, we're, we're, we're just shy, I think we're at about 650 out of 700 right now. And what's interesting is current therapy was really much more negative there than in the United States. Um, again, the long acting oral was the first preference in terms of what um, what people would um, would be interested in. But the subcutaneous, you know, the the two injections and the implants were both uh, much preferred over the long acting uh, over their current daily therapy. Um, and um, interestingly, in terms of sites clinic was preferred over home. So very different from what we found here where patients are comfortable taking drugs, uh, their medications at home. In Kenya, they would prefer not to have anything at home. Um, and then uh, the other attributes were very similar uh, to, to what we found in the US. So that's where we are with uh, that research. Um, looking forward to completing that study and, and offering some insights from it. In terms of the implementation challenges, that's really, you know, um, something we're thinking about and, and then how would preferences fit into that. In the United States, the thing that's been rolled out for HIV treatment is the cabotegravir repilvirine long-acting regimen. Um, and it's been hard from a clinical standpoint because one has to really do some eligibility screening, making sure that people um, don't have drug resistance to the two active agents, um, for instance, but th there are a number of, of things to consider. Um, the induction period on oral treatment, you need at least six months, so you need to be virally suppressed. There was an oral lead-in to test for adverse reactions that has now been waived, um, so uh, because there, there were so few adverse reactions. But um, the injection volumes, site reactions, managing all of that um, is it has been a challenge. Uh, a lot of people are thinking about uh, you know pharmacokinetic variability with uh, different BMI, which has been shown to uh, impact sort of clearance. Um, you know, dosing strategies for people we haven't studied, but the logistics, the cost, and then coverage, if you stop those long-acting meds and they stay in your um, system for months, what do you do um, to prevent resistance from developing at that time? So there are a lot of issues and challenges that clinicians are working on. In terms of logistics, it is 
a challenge in terms of clinic space and staffing to have to do these injections and just have people coming in monthly or every two months, ideally, um, um, for for these injections. Um, and, and right now it's just very challenging to do that. So the workflow, the drug storage, drug access has, has been really a problem. And this is true for both cabotegravir's PrEP and for the cab um, repulverine um, regimen for treatment. Um, it's, it's not been very easy yet and getting access to the drugs and support for billing has been a big problem. Um, there are just a number of things, you know, do you have a formulary that includes them? Are you able to get them direct from the wholesaler or do you have to do what's called white bagging where you get them through an intermediary? How do you bill it? Is it set up in your EHR? Who's gonna coordinate the coverage, you know, and, and make sure patients can, can you know, don't get confusing bills? Um, and how do you sort of do the workflow and everything in your EHR. There are a number of issues um, related to drug access and billing support that need to be worked out. Um, and, you know, but even the, the staffing is such, such a big thing. I, you know, I, I mentioned the satellite uh, clinics and I think there's, there's just basically no way at the, at the smaller satellites with very little staffing that will be able to do this. So it's hard um, thinking about who who would receive these treatments, um, you know, and just sort of going through the checklist has been challenging. Um, for patients who are virally suppressed um, already on an oral um, HIV treatment regimen, um, uh, we, we've had to use sort of archived DNA testing to look for um, resistance mutations. And it's not real standard. It, it's not yet really a perfect thing. So you sort of need to also look at all of their history of any drug resistance uh, they've ever had. So there are a number of things. There's some drug interactions to encourage or to, to, to consider. And it's 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 been a little more challenging, but the ability to historically keep appointments is also something that all of these that people would, would like. And that really, you know, th th then it becomes a, an issue of really how are we going to um, get to the people who are struggling the most to even make their appointments um, so it's not clear this is going to help us too much with the gap. I know there are people like Julie Dombrowski and the uh, the folks at, uh, at King County who are going to be doing mobile vans to go out and find people for their injections, and we'll have to see how that goes. Um, so finally, just to wrap up, what is the future of uh, long-acting treatment and prevention? I think this is going to have an important place. Those lenacaptivir-based regimens are most uh, promising. It is super potent. The capsid inhibitor seems to be a, a good way to go. There um, are ongoing, um, um, it's also, you know, you, it can be done subcutaneously or orally, which is really fantastic. So very versatile. There is a trials for PrEP. Um, the results are due, due in 2024. For treatment, lenacapavir has been demonstrated to help in very treatment experienced patients with resistance. It can increase the CD4 count and in improve viral suppression in that population. Uh, there's a trial that demonstrated um, efficacy when you combine it with oral descovy, although why somebody would want to take a pill every day and get an injection every six months is not so clear. Um, these other trials are going on for the weekly PO, uh, mislatrovir, lenacapavir. That, for our results, that people would, would prefer long-acting oral, that might be very promising to me. And then this twice-yearly uh, broadly neutralizing antibody plus lenacapavir, I, I, I don't know if that's going to be good. It's been very challenging, the broadly neutralizing antibodies um, uh, are are. are you can have escape variants. They are not super potent um, for suppressing HIV, but maybe that will work and, and would be an attractive thing if every six months, but you'd still have to get an infusion plus an injection, which is not ideal. Lung implants may be good. They're, you know, they're removable, they're fantastic, but you do need that, you know, insertions. It's a surgical procedure to remove it. There is a trial of an islatrovir implant that's ongoing right now, and that might prove possible for HIV prevention. Again, easier, but the feasibility of a multi-drug implant that would have that could be inserted and removed uh, so that all the drugs were, were 
were on schedule, that's going to be hard. And it might be that you'd have to have a couple of implants next to each other if you did a combination regimen, which also seems challenging. So for me, the future, uh, I think people still like self-administration, gives them control. Um, some patients are just going to like the daily oral tablets, and we should just continue doing that. Um, although peer pressure and physicians could change their mind if there were some advantage. Cabanuva is the first on market, sorry, market, um, and will continue to be used. Um, but these implementation challenges of having these injection clinics are real. And we really need to look at who is accessing it. If it's mostly people who are already undetectable, I'm not sure that this is going to add a lot to the um, armamentarium. The lenacapavir is coming and we'll see. But we really still need um, in, uh, research in this area to think about how to target what we have as it becomes available, how to overcome barriers to people using them, and really what, what the cost effectiveness of this is for um, overall uh, you know, for governments, uh, for uh, for uh, patients, and also for just the end the HIV epidemic um, in general. So I'm going to stop there. I'm going to acknowledge um, all my teams in in the different places for our study, and happy to take any questions. Fantastic! Thank you so much, Dr. Graham. Um, it looks like we do have a few minutes left here for questions. And so any questions that people have had come up, please feel free to be um, submitting those through the chat function, uh, which I will um, pose to Dr. Graham. You're getting some appreciation through the chat function right now, Dr. <laughs> Graham. Um, I think one thing that it really stood out to me would be I'm trying to think about whether to sort of conceptualize what your chart demonstrated as an aversion to injections versus just a strong preference for oral medications. Um, and especially, you know, knowing that so much of the work I think has been recently in injection based medications, um, whether, whether I should be thinking of that as gosh, that just really isn't even going to be that interesting to patients or if it's that, you know, without a quickly coming option for long acting orals that it still would likely be better than sort of the daily orals, if that makes sense. And I'm not sure if you have any comments to make on that. Yeah, you know, I, the, what's interesting about these, about the overall result, and and I, I find challenging about presenting just the overall results, is that they are averaged across the entire population. And so that's sort of the gestalt, like for, among people with HIV, definitely there seems to be a preference for a long-acting oral tablet, oh, at least in the U.S., long-acting over their daily. Um, and then these other things maybe struck people as inconvenient or things that they didn't like, needles. When you split the um, the, the sites, um, and in our, our publication, I think I referenced on the slide, if you look at Atlanta versus Seattle, those... the the bars are different, and um, and especially in terms of um, the preference for um, daily oral, um, the Atlanta folks were more happy with what they had with the daily oral, and Seattle, um, the Seattle population was just more willing to try new things. So you can see that when you put those populations side by side, um, and then when you move on to sort of looking at um, at these preference, uh, the the preference patterns in latent classes, they're under this variability. There are these different, like I, you know, maybe a Venn diagram of patients with different preferences. And so, um, really thinking about how would you approach this with a patient, um, it's it's a it, it would be sort of making sure they have the information on their options and that you're able to based on what you know what some people don't like or like about them to kind of go through and negotiate um, sort of a decision with the patient, assuming there's no cost problem, um, about what they what would would they like the best or want to try first. Um, and it's, you know, there are things, uh, decision tools that people develop that can be used with patients to help them sort of walk through when they do have those choices. 
Um, and I think, you know, that we may end up with that sort of thing. Certainly for PrEP, people are starting to develop that because there are a lot of different choices now for PrEP that are starting to become available. And, and you know, it, if, you know, all things equal, if people can afford and they don't have any copay issues, then um, then then people will would probably want to just go with the one they prefer. Now, there are different costs to the system. There are different costs to patients. And that's where it can get muddy is, you know, um, if you have a copay for your injection, for instance, patients don't like that. <laughs> Sorry, anything else? <laughs> Yeah, I know it's one o'clock already, but I'll pose you one more question in the chat as understanding that some people may need to be hopping off already. Um, the question that we had come in, though, is if, uh, gosh, I apologize, I'm not good with saying these names, but if lenacapavir is more painful than cabinuva, uh, do you have a sense of how patients will likely view the trade-off between less pain versus longer injection interval? Yeah, so actually, it seems that the injection site reactions with lenacapavir are less. Um, it's sub Q, and um, there are some nodules, but in the trials that have, have looked at this, often the nodules were palpable or noticeable by the clinicians more than the patients. Um, the cabinuva with the IM injection, um, it's it, the pain, um, it, it's more, more of them were considered, you know, it was mild or moderate, whereas with lenacapavir, they were almost all mild. So the IM injections may be the one that, that really is an issue. I would predict that for PrEP, that is every six month lenacapavir is going to be something that some people are really going to be very interested in. Um, and, you know, just that idea of, of course, you know, then people at clinicians have to track them down at least with prevention, if somebody stops it, it's okay <laughs> sometimes, depending on the risk. But yeah, I, I think it'll be very interesting to see where this settles out. But uh, pain is not a big issue so far with the Lena Kaplavir. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for this outstanding talk. And I think a really important sort of update on where things are at. I think, as you say, it'll be very interesting to see where this goes in the future. Um, and now it is 102 and I see folks are off to their next activities. So um, thank All you right. so much to everyone for joining us and to Dr. Graham for presenting today. And um, we'll be back in two weeks. Great. Thanks so much. Yeah.